Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. As a challenge, I decided to read the top 100 scientific papers of all time. But what does that actually mean, the top scientific papers? Well, one definition is looking at the citations on those papers. When scientific papers build on work that has been done before by other scientists, which could be a discovery, or a theory, or a lab technique, they will cite that work. That's what these numbers mean in papers. They're referencing a previous scientific work that will be listed at the end of the paper. A frequent measure of the success of a paper, then, is the number of citations it receives. And that's a goal that scientists frequently shoot for. They want to write papers that will get lots of citations. So for this video, I read the top 100 most cited scientific papers of all time. By one measure, that makes them the best, though it's far from the only way of looking at it. Finding those top 100 papers, however, was surprisingly difficult. I tried using a Python script to scrape Google Scholar, but that didn't work. I tried using other websites, but they don't allow you to sort by the raw number of citations. So instead, for this video, I used a list compiled in 2014 by the journal Nature. So the list that I'm using in this video is a little out of date. But for reasons that will become clear, I highly doubt that this list has changed all of that much. So what's on the list? The oldest paper in the top 100 was published in 1925, and the youngest in 2008, with the decade seeing the most entries being the 1980s. Plenty of time to accrue citations. In terms of subjects, biology dominates the list. 39% of all the papers described techniques used in biology labs, and over 50% were related to the study of living beings in some way. There's actually a Nature article with additional breakdown of these statistics, which I'll leave linked below. But just to add something to that article, something that surprised me about this list was the number of single author papers. So science these days is generally regarded as quite collaborative, and you'll very frequently see papers written with lots of co-authors. And to give you one extreme example, the team that discovered the Higgs boson at CERN published their paper in 2012 with 2,932 authors, 21 of which were actually deceased. It's not that unusual to see single author papers, but I was surprised to see so many in the top 100 list, though the frequency of those single author papers definitely decreased as time went on, which is what I expected. But regardless of the number of authors, what does it take to get a paper into the top 100? Well, again, this is in 2014, so the number will be greater now. In order to get a scientific paper into the top 100, it needs to have over 12,000 citations. To put that number in perspective, the overwhelming majority of scientific papers ever published have received between zero and nine citations. If a paper gets over 100 citations, it's already in the top few percent of all published papers ever. So to get more than 10,000 citations is really extraordinary. Soaring above that figure are the top six scientific papers of all time, which are all on techniques used in biology labs. They received between 50,000 and 300,000 citations by 2014. It will be even more by now. This was a daunting start to the list, seeing as my background is in physics, not biology. So I asked my friend and protein fanboy, Dr. Alex Lathbridge, to give me some reading notes on these papers. And he described them as covering the holy trinity of bioscience research, improving our ability to research DNA, RNA, and proteins. The top paper of all time is by Lowry et al. Protein Measurement with the Folin Phenol Reagent. This describes what's now known as the Lowry assay. Now, assay was a totally new word to me when I started this project. Basically, it refers to a technique used to measure the amount of, or the presence of, or the activity of a thing in a sample. So the Lowry assay in particular is used to measure the amount of protein in a sample, and it uses colorimetry, which is a word that I'm probably pronouncing wrong because it was another new word to me in this process. Basically, it's a technique where you do some stuff to a sample that causes the sample to change colour. And in this particular case, the more your sample changes colour, the more protein is present. This paper was at the very top of the list because it's a technique that scientists use 
all the time. Chances are, if you are working in a lab and looking at proteins, you're going to use the Lowry assay. So when you write up your work into a paper, you might cite Lowry et al. Similarly, the second paper is by Lim Lee et al, describing an improvement to a technique called SDS PAGE that separates out mixtures of proteins by their weights. Again, a technique that everyone now uses and has to cite something. The third paper describes the Bradford protein assay, a different way of measuring protein in a sample. The fourth paper is about Sanger sequencing, one of the early methods of sequencing DNA, so working out the order that your G and C and T and A bases are in a sample of DNA. And fun fact, Fred Sanger is one of only four people to have won two Nobel Prizes, one for this work and one for his work on sequencing proteins. I'm going to quote Alex on the fifth paper, DNA is for nerds, RNA is lit. This paper is the first one to describe a technique of isolating RNA, which, again, quoting Alex, is the cooler, less stable sibling of DNA. Alex also says that he is the RNA in our friendship. Finally, the sixth paper in the top six describes a technique now known as the Western blot, which is used to identify a specific protein in a mix. I expected to find these bioscience papers to be the most difficult to understand on the list, but perhaps because the pandemic has made everyone a bit more aware of bioscience, or because frankly they often read more like recipes than theoretical papers, I was never too lost. By contrast, Physical chemistry had 16 papers in this list, and they were way more difficult to understand. I think partly because they were using terminology from quantum and atomic physics, which I understand, but in a completely different way, like in a different context. So I half understood what was going on, but in a way that just kept tripping me up. It was super frustrating to read. Density functional theory, right? Not even once. Okay, but what else is in the top 100 papers of all time? Well, what's surprising is what's not in the top 100. Chances are, if you've heard of a big scientific breakthrough, it's not on this list. For example, the discovery of DNA, chaos theory, special relativity, the Schrodinger equation, none of them feature on this list. That's because this list largely describes methods, with a few very notable exceptions. As we've already seen with the bioscience papers, if a technique is used everywhere, the paper describing it is going to get a lot of citations. By contrast, big discoveries just don't get cited as often. This is the problem with comparing the merits of different scientific papers just based on the number of citations they receive. For example, the work of Einstein has completely revolutionised the way we look at the universe, but has received far fewer citations than a slightly improved method of isolating a protein. Part of that is because the way science is done has changed, it's become more formalised and bigger over the past century. But really, trying to assess the impact of an idea, of a piece of science, is inherently subjective and can't just be boiled down to one number. Constructing a list in this way is inherently biased. All that being said, there was some really interesting stuff in this list, and I learned about some really cool new science. Some personal highlights. The paper with the best title was just Fuzzy Sets. This was the highest ranked maths paper on the list, and introduced this idea of a set, which is a collection of objects, where an object can be in or out, like in a normal set, but also somewhere in between, which allows you to do some interesting analysis. The shortest paper in the top 100 was by Feinberg and Vogelstein, and it's a one-page addendum to another paper. It describes a slightly improved method of keeping track of the enzymes which interact with DNA. Some of the most scientifically interesting papers to me included Saitu and Ney, proposing a method of constructing evolutionary family trees based on statistical differences between DNA samples from different species. That's just so cool. Weber and Osborne, introducing a technique of sorting proteins based on how they respond to an applied electric field. Novoselov et al, 
because it's the graphene paper. This was one of the notable exceptions to the dominance of methods over discoveries. It was a real joy to read. I'd never actually read the paper before. And interestingly, this paper and the paper on carbon nanotubes were the two highest ranked entries in the list for physics. I'd hypothesize because more papers are published in materials science that are going to extensively draw on graphene and nanotubes than in other areas of physics, with the exception of crystallography, which had a ton of entries in the list, though they were basically all about software used in crystallography. And lastly, Kirkpatrick et al, which used a computer algorithm to find optimal solutions to large complex systems by drawing an analogy to physical processes. And that's interesting enough on its own, but it concludes by saying the solution is an example of artificial intelligence, which in 1983 is kind of amazing. In fact, machine learning and artificial intelligence research are likely to be the only possible significant disruptors to the list since 2014, with a deluge of papers that are being published all citing the same statistical techniques, just like we see with lab techniques in bioscience. And interestingly, this is something that you kind of saw in the list anyway, as the further down you went and as time went on, you saw fewer and fewer lab-based techniques and more and more computer-based techniques or descriptions of software. Though, to be honest, I doubt that even the incredible explosion of machine learning research could rival the frankly astonishing dominance of bioscience in the top 100. Oh, and before I draw some conclusions, a couple of bizarre inclusions in the list. 61st on the list is a paper all about determining if a medical patient is left-handed or right-handed. And 79th on the list is Jorgensen et al's comparison of simple potential functions for simulating liquid water. This is a pretty early attempt at using some numerical techniques to simulate how water behaves, including electronic interactions, but I really don't understand why it's so high up on this list. Can someone explain to me in the comments why it is? I assume it's a chemistry thing. And if any one of you mentions density functional theory, I swear. In this experience, I learned about some fascinating science in topics that I never even knew existed before. Though obviously not in any great detail or breadth. It was like trying to learn to play the cello by watching Yo-Yo Ma play Bach for two hours. Don't get me wrong, amazing to see what can be accomplished. But it didn't really help me understand the fundamentals. More than anything, it was a fascinating window into how science is done. It taught me that biologists love assays, chemists love correlation energies, and earth scientists apparently don't like publishing papers at all. Over these papers, you could see the standard form of an academic paper coalesce as the century went on. And you could see techniques improve as later papers in the list would cite earlier papers in the list, and science would be done in these incremental small steps paper by paper. A phrase that you sometimes hear when talking about science is attributed to Newton, that we can only see far by standing on the shoulders of giants, accomplishing all the wonders of modern science by using the work of monumental genius. But this experience showed me that science doesn't stand atop the shoulders of giants. It stands atop a long chain of small incremental discoveries, with the real linchpins in that chain being a handful of techniques invented by scientists you've probably never heard of, but used by scientists all over the world. Science is, to me, the ultimate human endeavor, not made by giants, but made by humans. And this list is the ultimate example, maybe, of what humans can do when we work together. As I found, simply reading about interesting science isn't an effective way to learn about it. The most effective learning is through doing. To become one of the great scientists featured in this video, it's not enough to study, you have to do. This is exactly what Brilliant, this video sponsor, is all about. Brilliant is a website and app that improves your skills in maths, science and computer science by introducing you to new ideas and immediately getting you to apply them. The emphasis is very much on trying, not being correct. After all, if you get it wrong, 
What's the worst that can happen? You just improve for next time. Brilliant offers interactive, expertly written courses from middle school to graduate school level across as wide a range of subjects as I covered in this video. Everything from computational biology to set theory, and some exciting stuff even beyond, such as cryptocurrency. The Brilliant app allows you to spend a little time each day improving your scientific thinking, while the desktop website makes for an ideal companion to classroom learning, taking the concepts learned in school and bringing them to gorgeous, interactive life. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark or click the link in the description. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription for themselves or for a student in their life. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for being, well, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope that you enjoyed this one because it was a really interesting experience, if a little exhausting, trying to unpick a hundred pieces of sometimes really quite dense scientific literature. If you did enjoy the video, please do give it a like and share it with people that you think might be interested in watching it as well. And if you'd like to watch some more stuff like this, then what do you know? I've got some other videos on this YouTube channel. If you like the look of those as well, then maybe you should subscribe. That just leads me to say thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time.